Tech for Seniors, episode 33, November 9th, 2020. Thank you everyone for coming. It's, uh, it's, it's great to see everyone today. 82 people joined. Um, Huey, how are you doing? Huey? Dewey? Oh, I'm, I'm doing here. great. I, I was muted. Oh, sorry, Dewey. Doing better. <laughs> we're, bo we're both here. Yeah. So, well, look, you guys, I'm going to get a sign and I'm going to have Huey and Dewey. And so, you you know, I'll put this up. Huey, how are you doing? Huey is doing wonderful. <laughs> and he's glad to be here. All right. Dewey, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing fine and I have my honey right next to me here. Hi, Joanne. Hi, Ron. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Good. We're fantastic. Yeah, great. Bob, what's going on up in uh, up in the mountains? In the mountains, the snow is gone, and happy to be here. Great. And Ray, what's uh, what's uh, going up on your end of the woods? Well, we had, we got about an inch of snow overnight, so uh, but it'll be gone quick. But I'm on, after this weekend, I'm a little bit zoomed out. <laughs> So, so just to let everyone know, the APC Big A Ray's the president of APCUG, or acting president, soon to be elected, I'm sure, for, for good, for president, president for life, probably. Um, and uh, anyway, we had the APCUG conference this weekend on Saturday. Uh, I know that uh, I presented, Bob presented, uh, Ray presented. So it was, uh, it was a pretty good, uh, pretty good conference. Uh, lots of interesting things happened. Um, Lots of lots of knowledge. So hopefully uh, some of you saw the show, and they will be. Uh, it'll be back out. They put it on their U YouTube channel, so we'll be able to look at those a little bit later. Eh, Ray? Yes, a couple of weeks. Yes. Probably. Yeah. Exactly. Now also to follow up with APCUG, don't forget this Wednesday is Bill James Home Automation um, series. I think is it is this the third one on home automation, Ray? I can't I think remember. So, yes. It's the third one, so yeah, and I and I hopefully Judy's going to send out the uh, send out the links to um, so that everyone can can have a look at that because it's, it's really good. So it's a free it's a free seminar. It's on home automation. So mark it on your Wednesday calendar so that we can. Uh, uh, it's po it's so posted can, in the chat. Is it posted in the chat? Great. The other thing was um, really interesting. The other thing happened on Sunday was Huey did his Win Sig um, show. Uh, and at the end of the show, they did one on, um, this was a data guy that does data recovery off of defunct hard drives and hard drives that have problems. It was super interesting, wasn't it, Bob? Yes, it, it was. was. It was really interesting. So um, it was recorded. So we'll hopefully get that, um, get that recording and we might even play segments uh, in the show because it's super interesting and it's not something we normally have. And this was really quite an interesting company. So that's, uh, that was good. Uh, now, just uh, before we get, we have a huge show today. So um, I wanna stop yakking away here, but I do have, I wanna put a plug in because I'm just gonna share my screen and I wanna put one plug in for, uh, for something I did. Uh, this is uh, my new video. This is the one. So what Bob and I were talking about on the weekend, Bob does his makes the makes the shows up. And of course, he, he goes and he talks to all the clubs. And then it's sort of the final episode when he gives the talk at APCUG, puts, sort of puts the, the show to rest. No one has seen this show. And this was my first time I did it at APCUG. So this is just started. This is the brand new calling Navigating the Post-COVID Era. Um, it's a 45 minute video and man, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. So um, I would, uh, so this is available for your clubs. If any of you want to, 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 to look at it, to use it, it it's on the, uh, it'll be, uh, it's on our website uh, and it'll be coming out in the newsletter. And so if you want to play this and see if you want me to come and talk to your club about it, I really would like to start to use it now because <laughs> it was a lot of work anyway. All right, that's all I wanted to say about that. I'm going to stop yakking because Bob is going to come up with our security update now. Share my screen, share my sound. He's four minutes early. Let's make it bigger. Here is the Avast Security News Roundup for the week ending November 6th, 2020. 
text scam lies about U.S. stimulus check, while the details of a second U.S. economic impact payment from the government to victims of pandemic-related hardships has yet to be finalized in Congress, including the decision on whether or not there will be a second dispersal, a tech scam has already cropped up pretending to offer the government check to users in an effort to swindle them out of data and or money. CNET reported that victims of the scam received text informing them they were being given a direct deposit of $1,200 from COVID-19 Treasury Fund. The text included a malicious link, which the victim is urged to tap in order to accept the payment. Never ever click on a link that comes from a source you do not trust. That's the golden rule to avoid falling into these scams. Volnanem Bot assigns names to vulnerabilities. The Computer Emergency Response Team Coordination Center at Carnegie Mellon University launched a new Twitter bot called Volnanem, which automatically assigns a random adjective noun, phrase, or for every new cybersecurity vulnerability given a CVE identifier. For decades, major flaws have been given these numeric codes, but usually researchers give nicknames to certain flaws, and that could be confusing when it makes them sound more severe than they actually are. The Volnanem bot was the, the danger of lesser vulnerabilities sounding greater and greater vulnerabilities sounding lesser. Read more on CDNet. Businesses scramble to protect cloud-based systems. While the trend started before the pandemic, the migration of using teams of remote employees and cloud-based infrastructures surged among businesses worldwide as the virus spread around the planet, opening up more vulnerable attack surfaces to hackers. As a result, many businesses are turning to white hat hackers to quickly identify their most vulnerable areas. Rewards for white hat hackers asked to weed out improper access control have jumped 134% over the past year, reaching just over 4 million in payouts. Learn more on dark reading. Gold seller JM Bullion suffers a data breach. Malicious script were present on the JM Bullion website from February 18th through July 17th this year, stealing customer payment information in what is known as a MAGA cart attack. After the malicious code was removed from the site, the online retailer of precious metals mailed a notice of data security incident to customers informing them that their names, addresses, and credit card information may have been compromised and that if they made any JM Bullion online purchases during that window, they should monitor their credit card statements. For more information, see the article on Bleeping Computer. Perimeter protection no longer the solution. As business infrastructures evolve to remote working models, the typical corporate IT department's cyber protection needs to change accordingly. Whereas the old model was to surround company systems with a protective firewall and other security measures. Today, that model is outdated since for most companies, their networks are integrated with the internet as a whole. Ars Technica maintains there is no perimeter to protect anymore and that IT architecture needs to turn inside out with security providers approaching each company system as a zero trust network, meaning it should not be trusted by default, but viewed as an already compromised system that needs full protection. And that wraps up this week's security news roundup. Stay safe. Hope to see you next week. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Bob? Yes, sir. We had a few people that were having sound problems, and it looks as though they got kicked out of the, uh, uh, off the, uh, uh, do you want me, I, sh I'm going to unlock the meeting in case they try to get back in. Is that okay? You That's fine. I'll, I'll keep an eye on it. Yep. I'll just keep an eye on it. I'll just unlock the meeting in case they want to 
uh, come back. They lost, but automatically came back in. They came back in. Did they? Were they okay? Yes. Okay. I came back in. I came back in. Okay. I was able to come back in too. <clears throat> I was able to come back in also. Okay. All right. Some are um, still locked out. Okay. It, I took the locking off. So some, there you go. Someone's Chris Rezinski is coming back in. So that's fine. All right. Let's uh, Dewey. Um, Dewey, I'm going to start uh, Dewey's presentation now. Let me share the screen. And we'll share his presentation. Good morning, everyone. Today is November 9th, and this is Dewey's Update. My topic for today is adding the print-friendly extension to your browser. I should mention that the reason I chose this topic is I discovered that people were having some problems getting this print-friendly extension. And so I thought I'd practice it myself. Turns out to be more complicated than I thought, so it became a great topic. I've, I'll go on. I've been speaking on printfriendly.com at the last several TFS meetings. For those new today, printfriendly.com is a website that allows reading web pages without the typical ads and clutter. It's almost like magic. You can make this happen with one click by downloading the print friendly extension into your browser. Here's how to do it in Chrome. And then I'll demonstrate how to do how to get the extension in Firefox. Now, first of all, open the Chrome browser. Please, from this point on, follow my yellow arrows. You first type in printfriendly.com into the Google search box, and it brings you to the print friendly and PDF application from printfriendly.com. I should mention that it used to be just print friendly. And then they added the capability of this application to also make a PDF of a website. So they changed the name of the application, but the website remains the same. The arrow is pointing to the print-friendly Chrome extension, and that's what we want, so we'll click on it. And by gosh, it brings us to the print-friendly website, and uh, you see the big black banner near the top, and right below it is a much less significant looking banner, and it has na the names of browsers, with Chrome highlighted. Since we want the Chrome browser, I mean the extension for Chrome, we're going to click on it. And it adds, says, click to add the Chrome extension. Well, that's easy enough. Well, uh, I guess we have to do it again. Add the Chrome. And we didn't get Chrome. Oh, uh, we instead got a kind of a funny looking thing, like you spilled some chocolate pudding on the floor, but it turns out to be a, a puzzle piece. And this puzzle piece, if you hover your mouse over it, it, the word extensions appears. And apparently this is now the universal symbol for extensions in browsers. So we click on this and see what happens. Well, we get a little box here and a quick read of it shows that uh, got several extensions already. But the print friendly and PDF extension is shown, but without the thumbtack blued in. So I'll click on it and see what happens. My gosh, it's blued in. And uh, clicking uh, on manage extensions, we go on and notice we're back at the, the Chrome web page or the Chrome browser uh, homepage, I should say. And we have now this new icon. It's a little square box, it's light brown in color, and it has like a computer printer on it. And that is the, the extension for print friendly and PDF. We'll go on now to the Firefox browser. There we type in print friendly in the search box. But that this time it brings us directly to the print friendly uh, website with the arrow on extensions. We, we're gonna, t I mean, I put the arrow there. The, you click on the extensions and you now get the, the kind of sub bar below the main black bar it has the names of browsers on it. Firefox is highlighted, and that's what we're looking for in order to install this print-friendly extension. So we'll click on it. And Microsoft stops us and asks a question. Allow print-friendly to install an add-on? Yeah, continued installation. Oh, <laughs> they want to check if we really are sure. So once more, they ask us, add print-friendly in PDF? Yes, add it. Well, th though they've added it, they want to make sure that we've got it. So we have to click on, okay, got it. Now, if you look, 
there's the same print friendly and PDF uh, extension icon in Mozilla Firefox. I'm going to leave the, uh, the PowerPoint program right now and just show you a couple applications of this, one in Chrome and one in Firefox. I have my Chrome browser down here, and if I click on it, here's a story called, What's the Difference Between Chromecast and Google TV? Now, those of you who were with us three or four weeks ago, you heard Ron tell us all about the new Chromecast with a remote control, and it's now connected to a Google app called Google TV. That's an old name, but it's used completely differently now by Mother Google. Well, anyway, if I go up here to the, to the upper right-hand corner I, and I click on the Print Friendly and PDF extension, look what happens. Now we have the whole story on the Chromecast and Google TV, along with some accompanying pictures and demonstrations. It's a great article. Once you read it, you'll understand much better this rather confusing new combination. Well, I'm going to get out of that and we'll come back to the to my uh, home page, and I'm going to click on the on Firefox now. And this story is uh, a story called Wise Cam Version 3 Review, A Big Leap Forward. Interesting. Well, anyway, what is the Wise Cam Version 3? Probably not many of you know, but I do know, and that's the reason I was interested in the article. The Wise Cam is a security camera made by Amazon. I bought one several years ago and it cost me, I think $37 or something. It was a great value at $37, a fine piece of equipment. Now they've got a new one coming out that's simpler, smaller, cheaper. It's not even available yet, but if you go to Amazon, you can pre-order it. It should be out within the next couple of weeks. And it's quite a camera and you can read the whole story here. But as you can see, it's again, it has a lot of this other stuff along the side and you have all that junk. So we come up here and we click on the print friendly and PDF extension and voila, here we have the wise cam version three review, a big leap forward and quite a story on the wise cam and a lot of pictures with it. And I don't want to take time to explain it all. If you're interested, of course, you can, uh, you can get it very quickly. So anyway, this is what it looks like to simplify or have a simple and easy to read version of a web story. And so I'll bring this up here. Well, it didn't quite make it. We'll try once more. And I'm going to say toodaloo and goodbye. Thank you very much for watching. Well, thank you very much, Dewey. The only comment I would have is that the little icon looks green, not brown to me. I'm not sure if we have some color blindness, but I think that- I, I am colorblind, Ron. <laughs> that looks green to me. Yeah, anyway. It, another one is even better. Something, he showed up in his last year around the middle, the top of the title bar called Reader View, which does the same thing without an extension. Well, except, except what we talked about that earlier in the show and what reader view does is it takes out all it strips out all the images as well so if you um if you the, the thing about print friendly is it keeps the images in there and you have the option of taking them out or not reader view strips them all out so um yeah you know you're right but it does it, it strips them all out okay uh let's see who's up let's see who's up next uh, uh, Ray, I think Ray's up next, Ray? Yes, uh, actually, uh, Edge calls that immersive reading now with the latest update. Let me, um... Well, good morning, Tech for Seniors. Today, we're going to talk about the Windows 10 October 2020 update. So the Windows 10 update numbering system has been confusing to say the least. But the first thing you should do is determine what version of Windows your computer is currently running. And you do that by clicking on the Start button, Settings, System, and then About, and that will tell you what version. Now, the old method used four numbers, and that represented the year and the month. For example, 
version 1909 meant it was the ninth month of the year 2019. Version 2004 meant it was the fourth month of the year 2020. But that last update, many users misunderstood thinking 2004 was somehow a reference to the year. So because of that confusion, uh, Windows 10 2004 was also known as Windows 10 May 2020 update, but was formally referred to as the April 2020 update until COVID-19 delayed its release by one month. Now, do you understand why this was confusing to some of us? So the new numbering system has the 2004 update now known as 20H1. 20H1 means the year 2020, the first half. 20H2 means the year 2020, the second half. So are you ready to update? Uh, the Windows 10 update to 20H2, otherwise known as the October 2020 update, has started to be released. But this time, Microsoft is taking a slower rollout approach to this update compared to those in the past. They say this will ensure a more reliable download experience. And I think Microsoft also understands that some devices may have compatibility issues. So the go slow approach is a sound cautious one. My suggestion is to wait until you receive the notice that it is available for your PC. And you'll can find this under start, settings, update and security, that'll tell you. Now, as an example, my eight-year-old HP Pavilion laptop and my five-year-old HP Envy desktop both received the update and all went very smoothly. My much newer and more powerful Microsoft Surface Book continues to run the older version of 2004. So it's a relatively quick update Updating from version 2004, or otherwise known as 20H1 now, is relatively fast, as the download and installation time was less than an hour. If you're updating from version 1909 or earlier, you can expect at least an additional 30 minutes more to be added to the process. There are two major updates to Windows 10 each year, one in the spring and the other in the fall, and the fall updates are focused on refinements instead of major changes, so that's why they go through more, more quickly. So what are the new features in 20H2? Well, mostly relating to the Microsoft Edge Chromium-based browser, which is now part of the installation in the update if you don't have it already. Uh, there's features called collections that makes it easier to gather information from different websites. If you use the Alt plus tab, then you can clearly see all the open tabs at one time. And they have something called Immersive Reader, which strips all ads from stories and allows the content to be read aloud if so desired. And the start menu has a more streamlined design with transparent tiles. Now, some control panel functions have been moved to settings, and this is going to be a, a continuing effort by Microsoft to get really with, to the point where control panel will most likely disappear. Listen to this, hard to believe but Control Panel was first introduced in the Windows 2.0 operating system in 1985, 35 years ago. Well, that's it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Ray. Great. All right. Great news. I, I updated a couple of computers with H2 and had no problems. It was a simple update, so uh, hopefully, hopefully it goes well. Ray, uh, he, um, Huey. Where's hey, that's me. Yeah, Healy. Are you? You're up. And I'm ready. Hang oh, yeah, that's second. good. Is this out of the way? And is this? And introducing Epic Cam. I'm Huey Poplock. How to turn your phone into a webcam and this is something brand new introducing epic cam corsair acquires epic cam a webcam app for iphone this was on october 29th this news item appeared the epic cam app is designed specifically 
to turn iPads and iPhones into a webcam for both Mac OS and Windows PCs. The software works across a number of popular teleconferencing applications, including Zoom, Skype, Google Meet, and Microsoft Teams. The deal brings the Epic Cam brand under Corsair's Elgato umbrella. The app has already been relaunched under the Elgato brand, including deeper integration with its existing products. The company promises that further updates are already in development. Now, who is Elgato? It's Elgato.com. They manufacture, or one of, the, one of their products is the Stream Deck. I happen to have a Stream Deck. I use it. I love it. But that's another story on another day. Right now, we're talking about the Epic Cam. Here's what it looks like on your iPhone, kind of. You can set it up in a flash with Epic Cam. The drivers are installed on your computer. Your phone automatically appears as a webcam in apps, like I mentioned in Zoom, Microsoft Teams, OBS Studio, and others. The requirements for Windows. You need to have Windows 10 or later. And you can have either a Wi-Fi or a USB cable. If you have a Mac, you need to have Mac OS 10.14 or later. And again, it uses either Wi-Fi or USB cable. There are four simple steps. Turn your phone into a webcam in minutes. Step one, get Apple Cam app from the App Store. Two, Download and install the computer drivers on your PC or on your Mac. Connect the phone to a PC via either Wi-Fi or USB. And step four, set Apple Cam as the webcam on your computer. And that's it. Easily add another angle to your content. Multicam setups add a whole new dimension to conference calls, live streams, and YouTube videos. But you don't need another USB webcam or a DSLR. With Apple Cam, simply add your phone as a source in your favorite streaming app. Then use your Stream Deck to switch angles with ease. Lose the cable. Want to set up a wide angle shot? How about sharing your whiteboard ideas? No problem. Epic Cam can stream camera footage to your PC over Wi-Fi, so you can move freely while broadcasting anywhere in your local network. Maximize your conference cred. Presentation is paramount. Zoom meetings shouldn't be shouldn't compromise your professional image. Employ Epic Cam to leverage the superior processing power of your phone, and just look polished online as you do in person. Make everyday moments shine. You can use your camera to uh, look at items, show items, show food if you're preparing meals, show pieces of paper, show another camera, uh, another phone. Whatever you want, you can move your phone around and use it as a camera. It beats any webcam. Use the Epic Cam for free or get the Epic Cam Pro to unlock the HD 1080p, video quality, HDR, manual focus, and more. The features with the Apple Cam Pro, you can see you have a lot more features, front camera, uh, Wi-Fi connection for both the versions, USB connection, yes, and NDI connections if you have that. But the Pro has, you can choose your connection, whether it be any of those. Choose, uh, use the phone microphone. You can pinch to zoom. You can manual, use the manual focus. You can turn the flashlight on on your camera and use that as a light. You can use HDR video, uh, dual camera zoom, adjust video quality, and uh, 
there is no watermark on the Pro version. But how much does the Pro version cost? It costs $7.99. That's $7.99. Not $799 like you thought. Nope. A mere 8 bucks. Now, they have other products available uh, for add-ons. Uh, I'm not going to go into them, but I just wanted to show you a picture that there are several things that you can add to uh, uh, to a boom uh, mic, uh, to, a, to a boom itself, to a uh, any kind of a stand, and so on, and even lights. Okay, it's time for our demo. Let's take a look at what you can do with your Epic Cam. This is my Logitech C615 camera, webcam, and it does have an eight megapixel camera in it. So it is a fairly high quality webcam. I've had it for a few years, but I wanted to show you the quality of it. And then I am going to switch to the Epic cam. Move the microphone out of the way here a little bit. This is using the iPhone Epicam. And currently I am using the back facing camera, which is a 12 megapixel camera. The thing is I have to, the camera is, or the, where I could see it is in the back. So to change the size to zoom i have to reach all the way around and i can't really see it but you can see i can really zoom in with it and it should autofocus. let me uh touch it because that's supposed to turn the autofocus off and on there we go so you can see that you can really zoom in if i needed to next i am going to stop and i'm going to turn uh, the camera around and use the front facing camera, which on the iPhone 8 that I have is only seven megapixels. So it's a little bit less than actually the webcam, but it's still, the fact is I can zoom in and out with it. And there's some other things I can do. So let's go ahead and we're gonna stop and switch the camera around. Switch back to the other camera. All right, we're back on. We're using the Logitech camera. Now I'm going to switch to the front facing camera on the iPhone 8 using Apple Cam. And you can see we're there. But the thing about it is now it's easy for me to go ahead and you know, I can really zoom in if I needed to. We'll zoom out just a bit. And so I can, as I look at the camera, it's, it's a lot better than looking at the screen. And I could move it over. And so it would be right in front of what I'm looking at. I can lower it, raise it. That's the nice thing. I have it on a tripod. Uh, but let's take a look. Let's switch back now to the webcam. And so you can see the difference the fact is I'm really zoomed in on me, but you can go back and forth like that. Now I am using the virtual background. And if I turn the virtual background off, now this is with it with the, so you see all of me, or, or in other words, I'm not disappearing into the virtual background. And then I'm gonna switch over to the webcam and you can see me there as well. In this case, actually, I like the webcam better, but I don't have the ability to zoom in if I wanted to, and so on. Now, there's going to be some other things I'm going to show you momentarily with the fact that I can use that. Well, let's switch back to the camera. And again, I can zoom in. Let's see, I can zoom out, and I can zoom in. I wonder how far I can zoom in. Well, I don't want to be that close. <laughs> Hi there. And we'll zoom back out again. We'll zoom out as far as we can. Let's see what that is. 
Okay, so it's a much wider angle. And but let's compare that now again with the Logitech. And there we go. The green is more the color of what you saw on the iPhone than it is. So the colors are actually much better as well. Okay, I am going to stop here. And then we're going to take a look using the camera in some other ways. Okay, I have now taken my iPhone and I now have it in my hand so you can see it here. And you know, it's difficult sometimes when you're on a, a Zoom call, for instance, on a Zoom meeting to lift up and show something and then it's, it's a piece of paper or let's say I want to show you this. Uh, right now it's, show, it's looking pretty good, but let's uh, do something else. I'm going to, with my iPhone, it's, I disconnected the USB cable. It just switched right over to being Wi-Fi. Okay, I have my iPhone in my hand, as I said, and I am going to now, uh, now switching it over to the back camera and I'm going to switch the camera within Zoom. Now I'm holding this in my hand. I could have it on a tripod fold and, and using some equipment so it's facing down horizontal mode. So we'll do it this way and there we go. Now we got it. Using the rear facing camera and we can actually then, I, right now I'm holding it in my hand and then I could demonstrate by which key I'm going to push and so on. Uh, while holding the phone up. Now I could get one of those arms that they, you saw I advertised on the slides, or you can build one your own. Uh, you can use a, some type of a tripod with something to, to make the phone facing down and be able to hold it that way. Okay, let's summarize a little bit of what we've talked about. One is the Epic Cam software for your iPhone. And again, uh, 6S or later because it has to have the ability to run version 14 of the iOS. And I believe anything earlier than that, uh, any iPhone earlier than that will not be able to run this, the uh, operating system, therefore the software. And you do have to, if you're running Windows, you need, need to have Windows 10. And if you're running Mac, it's 14.1, I believe it was, I mentioned earlier. Uh, of the Mac iOS. Uh, and I did not talk about the tripod uh, that I used. Actually, I did some searching and it was a selfie stick that I had with a base uh, that screwed on it that made it a tripod, just a, a little small tripod base that screwed into a selfie stick. You want to make sure that you also have a holder for your iPhone and that iPhone will need to be in portrait mode uh, when you're using it or should be uh, to get the right to get the right uh, uh, camera angle and for it to, for it to work properly. Ron let me know that he had recently purchased a UB size phone tripod, U-B-E-E-S-I-Z-E. -E phone tripod, uh, tripod from Amazon. It was only like $14. And it also had the phone holder uh, and a small table, uh, a small table tripod. You might want to get something a little bit longer, one that bends, one that, that goes so you can use it. Something on the table, uh, something like a uh, overhead projector type look down on it. Uh, that will hold your camera at the same, or your phone camera at the same time. So there are some things to get. And that's introducing Epicam. I'm Huey Poplock. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Huey. That's great. Um, will it work with an iPad? Yes. Oh, perfect. I got an well, iPad. Uh, again, I it, has iPad. Have, <laughs> it has to have iOS 14. And yeah. I know yours does, but not every, the one I have won't go past uh, iOS 12, so I can't use my iPad. All right.
Sure. Okay, uh, let's thanks thanks a lot for doing that. That that is very interesting. Uh, let me go. We're going to move on now, and I have to tell everybody about my new purchase this week. I had uh, money burning in my pocket, so uh, you know uh, I had to buy something. So I'll let everyone know what I bought. Right. Good day. It's Ron Brown with Tech for Seniors. I want to talk today about my new Amazon Echo Show 8 that I just bought this week. Now I'm sort of an Amazon guy and I own almost all the Amazon products. The Amazon Echo Show is one of three versions of the Amazon Echo Show products. They have the Echo Show 5, which is a 5 inch display, the Echo Show 8, which is an 8 inch display, and then they have an Echo Show 10, which is a much larger display. These are on sale now, an incredibly good value on Amazon. They're all discounted for the, uh, I guess, the Black Friday post Prime Day sale because, of course, they're on, uh, they're on Amazon site. I want to just describe the unit I bought and some of the uh, things I do with it. I think you might find these products interesting and so let's just have a look at them and see what, what exactly this is and what it does. These are the prices of November the 8th. I just took them off the uh, US Amazon site. They are in US dollars. And the first you'll see is the Echo Show 5, which is the smaller version. I have that, I have it sitting on my office desk down here in my studio. This is $89.99 on sale now for $44.99. I will tell you about these prices. I would expect, I don't expect them to go much lower. These are very, very low prices and have been on sale since, these devices have been on sale since Amazon Prime Day. And I expect probably the prices will last through and up until Black Friday. However, I will tell you that it is very difficult to get these devices in Canada. They were uh, sold out. In fact, when I went to order it, uh, they weren't going to be deliverable till March of next year. I was able to pick one up, my eight that we'll talk about next at Best Buy, but you could have some supply problems because these are very good deals. This is the Echo Show 8. It's an HD display and has Alexa. This is the one I purchased this week and we'll talk about it later in the video. Its list price is $129 and it can be purchased for $64.99 on the Amazon website in the United States. This is the 10.1 inch HD display model. This is regularly $229 on for $149. Now, this model is gonna change quite a bit over the next few months. Uh, the newer model will of course be more expensive, but it's going to have cameras that will actually follow you around and it'll be integrated with um, Zoom. So there are big changes for this model coming. This is an incredibly good deal for a 10 inch display and the great speakers that come with it. Let's look at this more closely. This is the unboxing of my Echo Show 8. This is the box that it comes in indicating that is the Echo Show 8. This is the white version and comes with Alexa. They come in black and white. On the side, you'll see that it has an eight inch HD screen, a camera with built-in cover, stereo speakers, a 3.5 millimeter audio output jack, Bluetooth, far field voice control, and also a microphone on and off switch. You can plug a sound bar into this if you'd like. It's also compatible with Amazon Music. Uh, you can play Apple Music, Spotify, Prime Video. It integrates with the Ring doorbell and also works with Philips Hue lights. What I want you to look at is part of an engineering design. This is an incredible box. How many times have you opened the top of a box and had problems pulling the uh, item out? Watch this. I unzip the top of the box here. You uh, then open the top. Watch, this is the open the top. And there's a handle. So cool. Then you just take the handle and lift the 
item out of the box. Now, isn't that so cool? Now, the first thing that you'll notice when you take the item out of the box is the quality of the machine. First of all, it's heavy. For something that costs so little, you would expect something cheap and not that well made. But you can tell immediately that there's very good quality. And it's quite heavy. Whether you get the 5 inch or the 8 inch, uh, there's obviously some, some quality here. One of the main purposes of this device is it acts as a speaker. Now I have uh, Sonos speakers in my house and I paid approximately $300 for each speaker. I think these sound just as good. Now I'm not as experienced as Dewey or as Ray. These are sound expert people. But I can tell you that I can't tell the difference and I think I like the sound out of the speakers out of the Amazon Echo 8 better than my Sonos. So the first thing you can use these devices for is you can put them anywhere you want. You can put them anywhere in your house and use them as a speaker. Someone is at the front door. So some of the specialized features of the um, the show is that it can be linked directly to your doorbell. So uh, if you have an Amazon doorbell and you want to have a, a visual image of someone when they come to ring the doorbell, uh, you can certainly put these devices wherever you want and they integrate seamlessly with the uh, ring products of Amazon. The other great feature is that uh, these devices play YouTube. This is huge. So um, in this example, uh, you'll see that we are playing a uh, YouTube video. Uh, if you have YouTube TV, you could play that. So this is actually be a portable TV player. Uh, you can, uh, it has two browsers. It has Silk and Firefox installed on it. And these work very well. The native uh, browser Silk works extremely well and so you can play all your uh, YouTube videos and repertoire uh, as well. So give these devices a try. They're on sale now on Amazon. Incredibly low prices and they're very good quality. They do a lot of cool things. Give them a try. Ron Brown with Tech for Seniors. Uh, and just to follow up to that, there were three things I forgot to mention. Um, these all have to be plugged in. There are no batteries in them. You plug them in. They're powered by a wall power. Uh, they also connect through uh, Wi-Fi, and that's how they work. So you need a Wi-Fi connection. The other thing is uh, they will not play Netflix. They play Amazon Prime and all the videos, but they won't play Netflix. So uh, just, just uh, those are some questions that you might have. All right, Bob, you're up next. Uh, you want to tell us about the system information of Windows? Windows 10, there are many ways to display the system information. There are even different displays for system information. Let's go through how to get to it in different ways. And then let me show you two different ways to actually look at system information. The first way we're going to go to get to system information is through the Start button. Click on Start, then click on the Settings, and next click on System. And that's one way to get there. The next way is a little bit simpler. Use your Windows key and the I for Information. Click those two keys. From here, you can now again click on System, and you're right back to the same thing. That's the second way. Just use the keyboard shortcut of the Windows key and the I key and then select System to get to the system information. Let's do the third way. On the right side of the computer, the notification button or icon, click on it, click on All Settings, Information, and again, here's your system information. One more way. In the last video, 
I showed you how to pin the old control panel onto the taskbar. So now this time we're going to open the control panel that we had pinned in the previous video to the taskbar. Once you open it from here, you also have a way to get to the system information. If you do a left click on system in the old control panel, you'll notice that the display here for your system information is exactly the same as in the previous three steps. But there's now a different way through the control panel and the system icon within the control panel to display system information in a different way. Let me show you how you do that. This time, instead of doing a left click on system in the control panel, we're going to do a right click. And if you do a right click and select open, you now get to see the old way that we used to display system information before Windows version 10 release 20H2. So you now know many ways to get to your system information, how to open it in different ways, but you also now know a different way to display that system information. Stay safe, be free, I hope this helps. Well, thank you, Bob. Interesting stuff, eh? Tips and tricks. I got lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Ray, I, I feel my toe tapping. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. First, uh, let me show you my shirt today. I always try to have a musical shirt on, and most of the folks here are old enough to know what those are. <laughs> uh, sorry, so what are they? <laughs> oh, my God, Ron. Those are 45 RPM adapters. So oh. back in the days when you had... Uh, a spindle that was the Columbia spindle, I'll call it, and you had a 45 RPM record, you'd have to put the adapter in it in order to play on that kind of turntable. I remember I that, Ron. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I do remember that. <laughs> Elvis, the king of rock and roll. What is your favorite Elvis Presley song? Well, let's talk a little bit about Elvis. How many songs did Elvis record? Well, I tried to look that information up, and surprisingly, there is no absolute number. But taking into consideration all the singles, the holiday songs, his studio and live albums, perhaps all the songs from the motion pictures as well, the general consensus is 710. Of this, how many records did Elvis sell? Well, when you consider all the albums and the singles, and how many of them were certified as gold, platinum, or multi-platinum, the estimate is over 1 billion. Yes, that's billion with a B. Elvis had at least 149 songs appear on Billboard's Hot 100 pop chart in America, of which 114 made the top 40, 40 made the top 10, and 18 made it to number one. This information I was able to obtain from the website interestinganswers.com. So what is your favorite Elvis song? My answer may surprise you, as it is a song that most Elvis fans are not familiar with. It's not an original song written just for Elvis, but one that made the top 10 songs on the Billboard R&B charts in 1955 by a Brooklyn, New York vocal group. The song, which took 15 takes to finalize, first appeared on the Elvis is Back LP, released in 1960, when Elvis was discharged from the U.S. Army. After listening to this version by Elvis, check out on YouTube the original by the Four Fellows and see how Elvis was able to capture the soul and spirit of this beautiful song. Here is Soul. I hadn't heard that for a long time. That was great. Thank you. You've, you've, yeah, that's one of the his the lesser known songs, but my absolute favorite. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Thanks for playing it. That's good. Hey, you know what? It's ten <laughs> o'clock. Another hour's gone by. Wow. Dewey, are you going to be around next week? I wouldn't miss it. Dewey, are you going to be around next week? I expect to be here. And Bob? Uh, why not? <laughs> <laughs> And Ray, got no place else to be. <laughs> All right. Listen, I want to thank everyone for coming today. Uh, it, I think it was a great show. Uh, man, we packed a lot of stuff in in the hour. 
Uh, just remember, uh, it, we recorded this. It'll be uh, online tomorrow. Uh, if you subscribe to our newsletter, uh, you will be getting the uh, a copy of the recording. So it will be available and you can play it back uh, and, and watch any of the specific videos as well. So I want to thank everyone for coming and we will be doing this again next week. Uh, we'll be doing it on Monday, same time, same place, same group, same meeting ID. We'll see you again in one week's time. Stay safe and um, buy some tech. Hey, it's fun. It's uh, remember we got, we got sales on all month. It's great. So buy some tech and tell us about it too. That'd be cool. All right. Good Bye show. Everyone. Bye.